Hi, it's Lynn Liaz, and I have one of my favorite guests, and I haven't had him on for a while, Carl Gallops with me tonight, Pastor Carl Gallops. It's great to have you. I'm so happy to have you back. It's been too long, hasn't it? It has been too long, Lynn. <laughs> but that, listen, I'm always honored to be on with you, but thanks for having me tonight. I'm looking forward to it. Well, I am too. Our conversation is going to be really, really exciting. First of all, um, I think the last time I had you on uh, was about your book, Gods and Thrones. And since then, you've had two more come out, uh, the God's books. And your latest is Gods of the Final Kingdom. Why don't you just really quick kind of tell people a little bit about that? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I, I do have three books, all of them by Defender Publishing, actually four books and a fifth one coming out in just a few months. But anyway, those three books were the first ones uh, that were published by Defender Publishing. Uh, Gods and Thrones, as you said, then Gods of Ground Zero. Then my latest one that's out right now uh, of the God series is called Gods of the Final Kingdom. That was released in July of this year. Uh, so uh, I, we can, yeah, we can get into that in a few moments. Now, in between Gods of Ground Zero and Gods of the Final Kingdom, I also released with Messianic Rabbi Zev Peratt our book, uh, the, the Rabbi, The Secret Message and the Identity of Messiah. And I think you've had Zev on about that, I think. But anyway, so those four books, but the three gods books, I call them that, you know, gods and thrones, gods of ground zero and gods of the final kingdom. Um, my publishers refer to it as the gods trilogy. So it's often advertised that way, but I want to make sure your, your viewers understand that you can read any one first. You don't have to read them in a certain order. I, in fact, I would recommend to read my last one first if you'd like. Um, uh, but it, it, regardless, it doesn't matter. You can read them in any order. I wrote them so that they can stand apart from each other. However, I recommend to people if they like the one they read, then get the others. Because if you read all three of them, I, I truly believe with the things that I reveal in there, all of it backed up by prominent scholarship, uh, si the latest science, uh, the latest archaeology, all of that written in very uh, readable form, a lot of illustrations, a lot of narrative portions of it. But I think by the time they finish reading all three, they will have a really good grip on the deep, deep understanding of the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation, how it all connects, how that connects then to what's happening in the world around us to, in, in these prophetic times in which we're living. Um, so anyway, that's, that's my quick explanation. But the latest is Gods of the Final Kingdom. Well, your books are page turners, and that's for sure. For those Thanks. of you out there who are watching this, and you just are really into like the deep things of the Bible, the mysteries of the Bible, and just really getting in there, these books are page turners. There's just so much research that you do, Carl, and you yeah. really dig deep into word studies, and you point everyone to the scriptures to prove what yes. it is you're talking about. In fact, uh, one of your books discusses the biblical revelation of multiple dimensions, portals of time and time travel and, and things like that. Which one is that? Well, that's my latest book, actually, God's at the Final Kingdom. And, and that, that topic sounds a little sensational, but look, the Bible's very clear about those truths. And science is very clear that those truths are indeed um, understandable by science now. And so when, when you put those two together and go back and read the scriptures, people go, oh my gosh, I've never seen this before. I, I didn't really understand this before. And it brings a whole new freshness to not only the understanding of the scriptures, but the understanding of how Satan operates, the understanding of how the kingdom of God operates, and the understanding of how the demonic uh, masquerading of the last days operates. So it's, it's all there. Plus, Plus, it helps people understand the whole concept of death and dying, the truth of it as revealed by Jesus. It helps people understand the final uh, destiny of Satan himself. He's thrown into the lake of fire. Well, what does that mean? So all of that is explored in uh, the gods of the final kingdom uh, and so much more. But you asked that one question, so I, I was just answering that. Did, did you want me to kind of go into that and connect some dots or did you want to ask me something else? I know there's a really big uh, subject we're going to talk about here, too, in a second that has just been going viral all over the Internet we're going to hit on. Yeah. But, yeah, go ahead. Before we dig into that, 
connect some dots there because that's a very interesting subject and one that many people are very interested in, including myself. Yeah. Okay. Well, listen, here's how I think I would begin discussing this topic of, of, uh, multiple dimensions of physical reality, time travel, portals. Let me discuss it like this. Look, from the opening pages of the Word of God, literally the first couple of pages, to the closing pages, literally the last page, we are just, the Bible says, reveals that there are multiple dimensions of reality, and it never explains it. It doesn't try to defend it. It just says this is the way it is. For example, in the opening pages of Scripture, we discover the, the, the realm of God himself. Then he creates the earthly realm. Then God in that earthly realm fellowships from his realm, which he has already been in forever, and the angelic realm that he had already created before he created the earthly realm. We know that from the book of Job, when, uh, 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 when, when Job is, is, is being questioned, were you there when I, when I you know, created, the, when I laid the foundations of the earth and the, and the angels, the divine beings, the morning stars, they sang for joy. So we've got these two dimensions are presented in the opening pages. And then, of course, uh, after the garden fall, we read that God establishes a spiritual barrier with cherubim around the area of the, the real garden. Um, and then, then there is the fallen realm that's on the other side of it. By the time we get to the book of Hebrews, we're told in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament that everything... On the Temple Mount, for example, when it's talking about the temple and the activities of the priest, it says these are just a copy of what is behind the veil, the true temple, the true sacrifice that Jesus brought when he brought his blood. All of that's behind the veil. And again, when Jesus is crucified on the cross, he tells the thief, today you will be with me in paradise. Well, what you, the who you are, will be the state of being with me uh, you know, a personal experience in paradise. So, uh, so we read about all of that. When Jesus is preaching in his earthly ministry, he speaks of the rich man that dies and goes to hell or the prison or the holding place. Death and hell give up its dead, Revelation tells us, and they're brought before the th great white throne in the last days for the judgment. But back to Lazarus. So Lazarus is in hell, but the rich man is in paradise. Well, that's where Jesus, you know, told the thief, you'll go there with me today. But And then in between paradise and hell, Jesus says, is a great chasm that nobody can cross. And of course, Abraham does. So the implication is without God's permission, without Jesus's permission, he holds the keys to life and death. Without that, you can't cross that. So there's we're already introduced to three or four or five different dimensions of reality. By the time we get to the end of the Bible, we read about Satan uh, and his angels and the Antichrist, all that being thrown into the lake of fire. Another separation, another dimension. And we're told these dimensions are very real. Uh, the rich man, for example, he, he thirsted. He, he was in torment. It, it wasn't some ghostly, wispy, smoky existence, just like the thief on the cross. Today, you, the person of who you are, will have being. You will be with me in paradise. So anyway, uh, I, 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 I talk about this at length in the book, and, and I think it's probably done a little better in writing than I'm doing right here speaking about it. But the point is, from Genesis to Revelation, the word of God doesn't even attempt to prove or to, or, 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 or to give long treatises on the fact of multiple dimensions of physical reality. It just says, it is, it is. There are multiple dimensions. Now, science, in our last 100 years of scientific history, we now know this is a fact. We now know because of the, our, our understanding of quantum uh, mechanics and quantum physics and quantum particles, uh, we now understand the whole concept of multiple dimensions of physical reality and physical location. Um, we don't understand all there is to understand about it, but we know that's the truth. That's what the whole uh, uh, CERN-Hadron Collider is about. Uh, they are in the process of discovering all they can about these particles at the subatomic level, at the quantum level, 
that react. They want to know how they react, how they react with each other, how they interact with the world in, in a more precise way than we already understand. And they also, on their own website, and I have this quoted in my book and referenced back to their website, they speak about the fact of multiple dimensions of reality that they are exploring because they know they exist, and they're looking for, their words, the portals into these dimensions. And in the words of some of their top uh, level uh, scientists, they say, look, we know these dimensions exist. We just want to open the portals. And this is what they say, literally, quote, to see what comes out. That's a little scary, isn't it? Or to see what we can put in. In other words, they're trying to harness the power of the travel between dimensions, multiple dimensional travel. Um, I mean, <laughs> so in, in case somebody's listening to this saying, that sounds freaky, that doesn't even sound, just get on the internet. Don't go to back channel conspiracy sites. Go to, go to quantum physics sites. Go to scientific sites. Go to the site of the CERN Hadron Collider. By the way, China is in the process of building one even bigger than the one in CERN Switzerland. Uh, or, or in Switzerland. Uh, they're building one that they, they believe within the next eight years from now, it was 10 when I wrote the book, and now the book's just been out a few months, but I started writing it about a year and a half ago. Now it's about eight years from now. They plan on having it built because they want to to be on the cutting edge of this technology of multiple dimension and the possibility of dimensional travel. So listen, as strange as that might sound to some of your viewers that have never really explored this, and I know a lot of your viewers have, and they know exactly what I'm talking about, but as strange as that might sound, this is scientific truth. It is biblical fact. You and I and your listeners and viewers, we don't need science to support the Bible for us. We just take it by faith because we stand on the Word of God. We come from a biblical worldview. Hebrews 11 tells us that the things that were made— have been made by things that are not seen. The things that are seen are, 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 are made by things that are not seen. Well, we know that now because of quantum physics and, atom, and, and the understanding of atoms and molecules and, and then the subparticles and the, and the quantum particles and the, and, and the sub-subparticles. So now we understand that what was in the Bible for thousands of years it's absolutely truth. So we don't need science to back up. You and I don't. But it's really cool when it does because it helps people who are on the edge of believing in the Word of God or not. So anyway, I unpack all of this in, in my book. And if you don't mind, can I share one illustration that I, I spend about five chapters developing in a narrative form, but I can take three minutes and do it here in the verbal form. Can I share an illustration that illustrates multiple dimensions and the reality of it? Sure, Carl, you know that when I have you on, I just love for you to give details about all this interesting stuff, because it's really, really, really interesting to me. Well, so. you're very kind. And it dawned on me as soon as I asked you the question, I thought, well, what is she going to say? No, I don't want you to share it. What so if I, I did? What if just for the heck of it, like I just I, said no and paused for a few and said, oh, just kidding. <laughs> I, know. I, I feel like I put you in a, as soon as I asked the question, I said, now that was stupid because she's not going to say no. Bless your heart. Thank you for being so kind to me, Lynn. Oh, I'd love but, for you to go ahead. I'd love for you to. Yeah. Well, listen, and by this, by the way, when I say I spend five chapters developing it, I don't want your, your listeners and, and viewers to, um, to panic. I, I've, I've learned over the years, I've written 10 books now. So the last four or five or six, I've learned how to write in small chapters. Uh, my chapters in my latest books are only five pages each, sometimes six, maybe seven. Some of them are three or four pages, but I write in small chapters. So when I say five chapters, we're only talking maybe, you know, 10 to 15 pages. But anyway, anyway, um, this, this short verbal description is is developed in a narrative way. Very interesting. It just sucks you into the whole thing. But consider this. I want your audience to consider this. So if you're having a hard time conceptualizing the reality of multiple dimensions of physical reality, think of this. Think of a, a fish tank that takes up the entire wall of the inside of a huge room of a mansion of a billionaire. You know, it could be a saltwater fish tank, freshwater, doesn't matter. This fish tank just filled with its own world and all of these creatures, fish and, and whatever other uh, aquatic uh, creatures that could be a part of that fish tank. And so to the fish and the other creatures that are in that, 
to them, that's their entire universe. They're, they're not even aware that there's another realm of reality just outside the tank. Oh, they, they might see shadowy figures that pass by, you know, but what, what does the Bible say about us? That right now we just see through a glass dimly. Yes, that's what fish do in a fish tank. They just see through the glass. They see these shadowy figures. It's the same with us. Even when we come to the word of God, God reveals so much to us and the Holy Spirit in us brings that alive so that we can understand. But even then, Lynn, there's so much we don't understand about the angelic realm, the demonic realm, the absolute presence of God's throne. We only get glimpses of what God wants to reveal to us or what our mind can can grasp. We only get glimpses of that through God's word. All right, so the fish are the same. They're in this tank. Their world is real. It is flesh and blood. Now, it's a different kind of flesh and blood than our flesh and blood. Yet, just outside that thick glass on the other side is a whole universe that the fish don't have any clue about. So let's just pretend, for the sake of this for a moment, that one day a human hand reaches into the tank and pulls out one of these fish. And let's say this human, this is where it gets a little strange, but hang on, there are biblical truths here. Let's say this human has the power to turn that fish into a human being. Well, you know, the Bible says that when we pass through the veil of death, that we are, we are transformed. In fact, the Bible says we will be like the angels. In fact, the Bible says we will be like Jesus. It says that in the New Testament. It doesn't mean we will be equal to Jesus or we will become angels. What that means is our divine nature will be restored. We'll be like Adam and Eve. We won't die anymore. No more sin, no more death, no more dying, no more crying. All these old order of things have been passed away. So, so that's what happens when we're transformed. So let's pretend we take a fish out of the fish tank, bring it into the room, turn it into a human being. Well, instantly, from the glorified position now of being a human being, they look around the room. They're astounded. Instantly, they begin to speak in human language. They understand us. We, under, it, we understand it. It looks back at the fish tank, and it says, oh, my gosh, I recognize that as the world I came out of. Where am I now? And so they understand that they're in a room and they're in a different reality, but it's been there all along. It's just outside the fish tank. Well, to make this quick, uh, so the fish gets consumed with well, the fish. Now that's a man gets consumed. This transformed person, let's say, is consumed by, by what he sees, he or she sees, and they're just overwhelmed by it. And they're ecstatic. And they say, man, this must be like heaven. And the, the human in the room says, oh, no, I've got more to show you. And he opens a portal. We would call it a door <laughs> to the room. He opens a portal and the fish sees that uh, that's now a man. There's a whole mansion. And, and there's an upstairs and a downstairs and other rooms and all kinds of uh, things that belong to that world. And so they're just looking at it all and just overwhelmed by it all. And then the, the, the transformed one says, wow, so this is heaven. I mean, this is, this is the other world. And the human that transformed them says, oh, no, there's still another portal. They go to the front door. They open it. And there's what you and I would call the world and grass, and trees, and mountains, and roads, and cars, and buildings, and skyscrapers, and cities, and children on bicycles, and people. And then they say, oh my gosh, this is unbelievable. And then they discover that there are seven billion of us on this planet that's hanging in space, and they it's more than they can comprehend. And then they see, then the fish sees through a telescope at night and sees the universe. And then they look at a microscope and they see the atomic and subatomic levels. And then they're taken on an airplane ride and they see the earth from above. And then they go in a submarine and they see below the ocean surfaces, another whole realm of existence. Anyway, you can go on and on with this illustration, but the point is, there are multiple dimensions of flesh and blood reality and marvels. I mean, if, how can a fish in a fishbowl even know about humans, much less the intricacy of humans, much less the intelligence of humans, much less the things that we build and create, much less things like the internet and cell phones and communication and airplane travel and submarine travel, warfare, nuclear warfare. I mean, we could go on and on with this illustration. The point being, the Word of God tells us that this is how it is throughout God's mind and heart, throughout the universe and perhaps the universes that God has made. Why do I put an S on the end of it? Because the Bible is clear that this universe is just one creation of God. 
God does not live in the universe any more than the, than the creator of a computer lives inside the computer. The creator is outside the computer. The computer has been programmed with its intelligence to do all that it does at the push of a button. There's not a little man running around inside the computer making everything work. The person that invented it is outside of it. So anyway, I hope, and the book goes into all of this in a much more interesting way than the way I'm speaking it, but I, I hope that makes sense. And feel free to ask questions or challenge me or whatever, but does that make sense to you? You that yes, there are multiple dimensions of reality. We see them in our own world, like a fish tank and the outside world and all that it entails. The Bible speaks of it from Genesis to Revelation. And we are told by God, you've just got to believe me. Your mind cannot comprehend this any more than a fish could comprehend 7 billion humans on a huge green and blue marble, the size of this planet hanging in space on nothing and everything else that exists. A fish couldn't even, couldn't even begin to grasp that, which is why Paul, when he was caught up to paradise, he said, I don't know if I was in the body or out of the body. All I know is I was caught up to the throne of God, to the third heaven, to paradise. And I saw things that were unspeakable. I'm not allowed to speak of everything that I saw. Paul would later say, look, your mind can't comprehend your ears have never heard, your eyes have never seen what lies ahead for those that love the Lord. That's why Paul would continually write, I'd rather be absent from the body now. I'm present with the Lord. I've seen it. I've tasted it. I've smelled it. I've heard it. I want to go there. But until God takes me, I will be here understanding that we are ambassadors for the kingdom that is to come. Does all of that make sense, Lynn? Well, actually, I have been dying to tell you something Okay, as I'm listening to you talk. But it's going to take me a few minutes. And I guess we'll just save the other thing we were going to talk about probably because it's lengthy too. We'll save it for a sh- after you and I are finished here. I'll contact your person and we'll schedule for a second show. Okay, good. But uh, okay. So last year I'm on the way home from Oklahoma. I'm looking out the window of the airplane. And some of this is going to sound crazy to some people listening, not to you, Carl. And I'm looking out the window at the clouds And the Lord begins to speak to me about dimensions. And I'm like, Lord, I don't understand anything about dimensions at all. That always blows my mind. I have no comprehension. So he he begins to explain it to me through, he tells me to picture a sandwich, all the pieces hovering above each other. And I said, okay. So I'm looking out the airplane window, picturing a sandwich floating in the sky, you know, like a Big Mac or something or a cheeseburger. And so then he says, now I want you to picture them all coming together. But not only do they come together, they all meld into one another. They're all separate, yet they're the same together. I said, okay. And he said, now, and this is what's blowing my mind. He didn't use a fish tank, but it was very similar. He said, I want you to picture the ocean. And there's creatures in the ocean, tiny little microscopic creatures that have never seen the light of day. And they don't know anything at all beyond what is around them in the ocean. And in fact, In order for them to see the light of day, they would have to die. They would die if they came above the surface. It would kill them. I said, right. He said, this is the same with dimensions. He said, in fact, if you went, you know, under the sea, like some, you know, how divers go under and the creatures see them, they think there's some kind of, they freak out. The sea creatures freak out. They don't know what they are. You know, what are these things coming at us and all of this? So he says, there is the ability for, 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 those of other dimensions to sometimes be into yours. He was talking about spiritual things, but not necessarily yours to theirs. And I'm like, okay. And so he's just describing this to me about how they're all together at once in a different, like a different type of a way, if that makes sense. But he was using the ocean and the sea creatures. And so he says, just like it is, um, you know, for you, You can't come to heaven. You can't get to heaven just like the little amoeba or the sea creature can't get to the surface unless you were to die and and come there, you know, or some big spiritual event or something, you know. Um, So that was just interesting because you were explaining it very similar to the way God did. But then at the same time, God was also explaining to me about Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, which has somewhat to do with what things you talk about in your books. Um, He's explaining to me about the principalities that are in the air and stuff. And he says, now look out the window and I'm looking out there. He said, you just see clouds. I said, yes. 
He said, do you know there are principalities all around you that you don't see? And he said, he said, did I not appear before the Israelites as a pillar of cloud? I said, yes. He said, what does a pillar of cloud look like if you saw it? I said, it would look like what we see as a UFO or the wheel within the wheel and in the Old Testament, whatever it looked like that. He said, right. He said, well, the principalities have heavenly vehicles that are supernatural high tech that you can't see. And he said, they're everywhere. And so he tells me this and he said, now I'm going to, I want you to share this with the people someday. And I did in a previous video because it's powerful. I said, all right. And he says, so what they do is they have a type of a frequency or trans that they transmit to the minds of the people on the earth. He said, you know, the word stronghold. I said, yeah. He said, that's how they create a stronghold of their mind. He said, just picture, if you will, a beam of light shooting from their heavenly vehicle above to the minds of men down below. And he said, the demons are the imps on the earth that run around and to and fro and do their work. He said, they're, so they're shooting this transmission or the, through this frequency to the minds of men and they have it latched on like in a movie. You know how when you watch a movie, like a space movie, they lock the other vehicle in the heavens up so they can shoot at it and it's locked in place. He compared it like that. And he said, so there, I just want you to imagine millions and millions of beams of these light, their, their frequency or transmissions transmitting to the minds of men and women on the earth. And he said, and those are strongholds of their minds. And he says, what people don't know is when they, yes, rebuking and binding is important, but when they begin to praise and worship me amidst their obstacles, amidst their suffering, and they offer the sacrifice of praise, what it does is it reverses a transmission back to them and causes them great pain and anguish. Mm -hmm. It's a noise that just is so horrific to them. It, it just starts to break them down and then it weakens their transmission on the minds of men. He said, but what people don't know either is that they will come back and keep doing it. There are some that will just keep coming back and it's a lifelong spiritual battle that you have to keep giving me praise, the sacrifice of praise. You have to keep rebuking. You have to keep binding and doing these things. He says, but this is how it works. And I was like, wow, this sounds crazy. I was like, Lord, when do I need to um, reveal this? Because I think some people are going to unsubscribe from me or whatever. They're going to think I'm nuts, you know? And um, so it was just really interesting how he explained that to me about these principalities and how they are, they, and they send messages to our minds. That's how they speak to us through these uh, heavenly transmissions and strongholds they have. That's how they speak to us. And it's a high tech supernatural frequency that they use. And then when we do the praise and worship and use the name of Jesus, it actually brings them to great pain and anguish. And it just bounces it back to them. I kind of like that thought, imagining bouncing their own transmission, bouncing their own thing back to them and causing the pain. It's interesting. What do you think of that, Carl? Well, listen, you, you have at least illustrated a lot of biblical truths. Okay. Let me, let me tell you what I mean by that. As far as every detail of what you said, if, if, is that exactly how it is? We don't know because the word of God doesn't say some of the things you said. However, it's the same thing with the fish tank. There's nothing in the Bible about a fish tank and a fish becoming a man, etc. I use that as an illustration. So if God used this illustration to help demonstrate in your mind biblical realities, then, then I, I, I think it's great. So, for example, the Word of God does call Satan the prince of the power of the air. Absolutely. The Word of God does call Satan the God, little g, of this age. Absolutely. Jesus calls him the prince of this world. Absolutely. We also know that uh, the birds of the air are often used as a symbolism in the New Testament for demons. Uh, Jesus even said that when he gave the illustration of the parable of the sower and the birds of the air came and picked it off you know, the path. And then he says later to his disciples, said the birds of the air of the air represent the demonic and Satan himself and his kingdom. So all of that that you said is correct. Um, uh, and, and then the fact about the power over the mind, you know, guard your mind. Uh, this is our act of worship to the Lord. Be not conformed, you know, to the, to the teachings of this world, political correctness, but rather be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. And, and then Paul writes to the church at Corinth, and he says, look, here's how you do battle. We don't fight with physical weapons. We fight with spiritual weapons. We take every thought 
captive. Everything that sets itself up, every vain imagination that sets itself up against the kingdom of God, and we take it captive in Jesus Christ. So obviously, there is a way that Satan and the demonic realm can get into the mind of human beings. Can you describe it through your illustration as like light beams they're shooting down from the air? Yeah, uh, he did but, say the take the thought captive thing too. I forgot about that when he yeah. spoke that to me. Yes. Yeah, you so mentioned I mean, it. all of that, like I said, a lot of what you, you said is is biblically supported. So, you, you know, um, there has been theological speculation about what you said about like the vehicle transport. Uh, um, you, you know, the Bible gives some illusions, you know, that, uh, that God r- rides on the cherubim, it says. The scripture says uh, he rides on the wind. And some people say, well, that's just metaphorically. Well, I, I get it. But it also speaks of flaming chariots and um, the angelic realm uh, being kind of in charge of that. So, again, some theologians think that that's just symbolic. I, we don't know. I just know what the word of God says. And then I'm listening to you. And it sounds like the Lord was trying to conceptualize his word, the truths of his word, in a way that you could envision it in the same way that I use the goldfish illustration, the goldfish tank. Again, the Bible doesn't speak of a goldfish in a tank, and all, but it does say we look through a glass dimly, we will be transformed. When we are, we will know him as he is. There will be no language barrier. We will, we will see him as he is. We will participate in all the dimensions, just like Jesus told the thief today, you're going to be with me in paradise. Just like the rich man, Lazarus, you know, different dimensions, a chasm between him another dimension. Abraham was able to cross over, but only because Jesus gave him the key, let him through. I mean, all of this is in the scripture. So, so what do I think about what you shared? I think it's very similar to, to what I was saying with the fish tank. And you know, the thought that God put in your mind about the fish on the bottom of the ocean, um, I use that same illustration. God put that in my mind years wow. ago. It, it's wow. yeah, it's in my book, Gods of Ground Zero and gods and thrones. And I I use a little bit different. One, I have uh, fish in the bottom of a lake, I think. And the other one, I have fish in the bottom of the ocean. And I talk about the hydrothermal vents in the deepest portions of the ocean, four and five miles deep. Um, One of the deepest trenches, I think the deepest trench runs into the Caribbean or the Caribbean, people say it differently, um, uh, in the the Atlantic and and down into the Caribbean. So um, but 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 the ecosystems down in the deepest parts of the ocean, like you just said, like you 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 know that God revealed to you, those are real flesh and blood organisms, and there are crabs that live there, and fish that live there, and shrimp that live there. You can study this on the internet, and and everything they need for their survival is at the bottom of four and five mile deep. But you're right; if they try to go up. To break through the surface, they can't. They die. They can't do it. And even if they could get a glimpse, they wouldn't know what they saw. And their eyes aren't really fitted for air. They're fitted for water. And even then, if they just glimpsed a boat with a human being or two in it, they wouldn't know what that was. And they would still have no idea that there were 7 billion more of us and cities and space travel and airplanes. So so just getting a glimpse of it still tells you nothing So the word of God gives us the biggest glimpse we have. The Holy Spirit illuminates it. Your illustration, I think God used a lot of that for you to to help you to concretely and physically and humanly conceptualize something that is truly beyond our ability to understand until we're with the Lord. Again, the Apostle Paul said, your mind cannot conceive. And what that means literally is, You think whatever you can think about heaven, how amazing it would be. You can think of it as multiple dimensions, fish tank, uh, fish at the bottom of the ocean, um, everything that you just came up with. But Paul says, I've been there. I've seen it. I'm telling you, it's even better than that. Whatever, Lynn, you can think of, it's better than that. Whatever I can think of, it's more magnificent than that. Paul says you can't even comprehend it in the same way that a fish at the bottom of the ocean can't comprehend it, or a fish in a goldfish tank on the side of a wall in a billionaire's mansion cannot comprehend anything outside of that fish tank unless there's a transformation of that fish's body, mind, 
and communication ability. And the word of God says all of those things are going to happen to us when we're under the blood of Jesus and when we pass through the portal. Watch this. Jesus said, I am the portal, the way, and the life. Eh, actually, he says, I, I, I am the way, the, the, the truth, and the life. So he says, I am the portal, the truth, and the life. He also says, I'm the good shepherd. Nobody gets, uh, no, 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 the, the, the sheep can enter only through me. I'm the portal, you know, the gate. Right. Um, he, he says, um, he says, uh, 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 that my sheep hear my voice and I know them and, and they follow me. Um, no one comes to the father, but by me. So, I mean, over and over, we hear that there are portals, there are entrances. Some of them are locked down, only openable by Jesus himself or those of us that are under the blood of Jesus have right to access that eventually. But Satan has keys to certain portals that God allows, the kingdom of the air, whatever that actually means. And you think Some- about, too, how it's in all of our instinct as well when we see something, like when when animals in the ocean or creatures in the ocean you know, see a human being, they sent, they want to def- either run or attack, you know, and yes. we think about stuff like that, how if we were all sitting here and we saw some strange thing coming in through space, what would the government do? They would begin to attack. We want to defend and attack. We, we just don't understand these things. And our first defense is to reject it, to either reject it or to run from it or to attack it. And that's our first defense instead of really trying to comprehend it. And we can comprehend these things because it's all right there in the Bible. That's one of my joys of preaching and teaching the Word for almost four decades now and writing for over a decade now is to try to take these concepts that are truths in the Bible but yet are so hard for you know, the human race to understand me too. I mean, you know, but I have to dig and study and connect the scriptures. Then I go to what scholars have said and how they've tried to, uh, conceptualize it. And then I ask God, give me some concepts, give me some illustrations. And he has now I'm sure that he's given other people. I mean, he just gave you, I mean, you're telling me of illustrations that I've written about, but yet he gave them to you. And I'm sure that others way before you and me have been given uh, the same by the Holy Spirit, but the same kind of understandings and concepts. So I use other illustrations like a, like an animal, a deer in the deepest woods, you know, they've never seen a human before. And then one day they're confronted with a human. Uh, how do they describe that? What do they know? They see a man with a, with an orange hunting vest and a, and a stick in its hand that goes make sound like lightning or a thunder. I mean, you know, but, but just because they've seen that one human and they flee from it because they know somehow it's danger and they hear this boom go off behind them. If they run back to the deer herd, how are they going to explain that? They still don't know anything about sexuality. Like they saw a human, more than likely a man, women hunt too, but more than likely a man. It means they wouldn't know anything about female humans. They probably wouldn't know anything about children, humans. They, they wouldn't know anything about the car that he arrived in the woods in. He, they, they don't even know what the gun is. It's just some kind of a stick that makes noise. You understand. I mean, there's so many ways to illustrate these truths that are right before our eyes. Ants in an anthill. These ants don't know we exist. They don't have a clue. They know something's out there, but they don't know about the planet and 7 billion humans and all that life exists around human beings, but yet they're real. We're real. The deer are real. We're real. The goldfish is real. We're real. The fish at the bottom of the ocean are real. We're real. We're all on this same globe hanging in space, but all of these other creatures really don't even know that we exist, and if they do like deer that are in a more populated human area. They know we exist, but they still can't comprehend what and who we really are and what we have created and what we use on our daily basis. These these dimensions exist side by side. And the greater, the greater intelligence, in the case of the earth, human beings are the greatest intelligent. We're like gods to monkeys. We're like gods to the deer. We're like gods to the goldfish. Yet beyond us, we've been created a little lower than the angels, the Bible says. So beyond us, there's the angelic realm, the demonic realm, supernaturally. They are much more than we are. We have to be very careful 
It's very dangerous. And then, of course, the throne of God itself. So, you know, the Bible speaks of these things. It has been for thousands of years. And you and I are just coming along in in these years now, in these prophetic times. And we're asking God to give us ways to help human beings understand these truths. We need to get serious about these truths. They're not just cute little things we talk about and study about in the Bible so we can impress everybody with what we know. These are biblical, spiritual, eternal truths. We will live forever regardless of what we've done with Jesus Christ. It's just a matter of what dimension you will live in. Amen. Thank you, Carl, because I think just like myself, there's a lot of people out there who are so interested in those things and they want a biblical perspective on it and they want to understand it, but it's so beyond our minds to understand. And I really appreciate it, how you put it in a way that we can actually understand and you go in more detail about all those things and so much more in your book. And uh, I'll have the links by the way, where people can purchase this below the video and also I'll have it on the screen. And if you want to mention to them real quick too. Yeah, yeah, please do. Well, uh, the quick way to start is just at my website, carlgallops.com. But of course, I have an Amazon author page. Um, You can get package deals through my website, Um, you know, mix and match books, and we get them at great discounts. I mean, I can sign them and send them to you if if you want that. Or you can just order one on Amazon today or Books a Million, Barnes & Noble, anywhere these good books are sold. You can get all of my books. Now, the other thing I want to tell your audience, if, if this has interested them at all, but they're saying, you know... I don't want to pay 15 bucks for a book that I really don't know everything about other than what I heard Carl and Lynn talking about. Go to my website, click on the banner about the book. You'll go to its website. You can click read inside. You can see the whole table of contents. You can read four or five chapters. You can read the back cover, the front cover. You can see what people have said about it. You can watch the promo video. You can see the writing style. You can get an idea of what it's all about. And then you'll know whether you want to get it or not. So I just tell people usually just to start at my website, carlgallops.com. Thank you, Carl. And again, I'll have that on the screen all throughout the video and beneath the video in the video description. Those of you listening right below the video on YouTube, it'll be hyperlinked. So, you know, if, if you want to and that's easier for you, click on that. You can just click it and go and check it out. And Carl, thanks for doing that for people so they can have an opportunity just to kind of check it out first before they get it. That's really nice of you. A lot of people don't do that. Thanks. No, it's my my pleasure. I I want people to be satisfied, you know, with what they get. I want them to have an idea of what they're what they're getting when they get it. I, I think, listen, I'm getting a lot of great feedback from it. You know, the haters are out there, the people that don't even read the book and they run to Amazon and put some one star review. And you can tell from the review, they've never even read the book. They don't, they didn't even buy it. I've they got just, some of those on my reviews on Amazon I, for mine. I, yeah, I know. I know. And I don't even care about that because my books are distributed through so many different distribution points. It, it doesn't hurt sales at all. Oh, and I, I don't care. But the point I'm making is the people that have actually read it and that communicate with us daily through my offices, I've got one at the church and several people there, several administrative assistants, and I've got one at home. I've got an administrative assistant here. Um, it is, uh, the feedback is amazing. And I, and, I, and I teach and preach a lot of this in prophecy conferences, and, and I spend hours ministering to and counseling people. So I think the Lord's using uh, this ministry and this teaching and these books to really get into the hearts and souls of people in these prophetic times. I pray so anyway. I mean, you know, if God can use me in any way like that, then I'm overwhelmed. I mean, who am I that he could do that? But anyway, thank you for your kind words, and thanks for letting me explain a few things. By the way, that book, Gods of the Final Kingdom, uh, has tons more stuff in it than what we've talked about tonight. That was just one little topic. Oh, I know. It's hard. You know, I'm telling you, Carl, some of these uh, subjects— you could just literally talk about one little thing from the book and you could talk about it for hours and hours. You could actually make a book out of each subject in it probably, I'm sure, you know? Yeah, I know. Yeah. That's yeah, That's been one of my struggles as a writer is I, I don't want people to think that I'm taking one topic and, you know, just yeah, saying – just expanding upon it just to expand upon it. So what I try to do is to take these concepts, give people enough information scientifically, historically, archaeologically, biblically, that's the most important, and tie it together and then tie these topics together so they can see from Genesis to Revelation, all of this fits like this. 
And once they see that, that's when people have the aha moment. And uh, so anyway, thanks. I get aha moments just listening to you talk about it. So ah, you're so kind. Aha. Uh-huh. But this has been an awesome conversation. I've loved having you and I'm going to have you back because there's some other stuff. Well, we'll talk about all sorts of stuff. I can keep having you back, keep having you back. The other thing we were going to get into, we'll save that for the next show. Okay. But I so appreciate you taking your time because I know you've got something you got to go do. I do. But I appreciate you taking some time out of your day to just share this awesome information with my viewers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, in the Lord, I love you, and I appreciate your show, and thanks for having me on. You've got a great audience. Uh, they're very kind to me, and and, um, and and the Lord's using you. Keep it up, Lynn. Keep it up. Well, thank you, and you too, and God bless you and your family, and I love you guys. Dearly pray for you all the time. It's been thank a you. pleasure, Carl. Thanks thank again. You. It's my honor. Thanks. <laughs>